Hey, everybody, this is Tim Shaw. Thank you for stopping by at the Black Cat Lounge for another Tuesday night and sharing your sharing your wonderful lives with me. It's, and I know, you know, it's kind of funny because now we're at that point where it's getting lighter now. So I don't really expect people to be actually watching, you know, but uh, I really appreciate when everybody stops in and we have a lot of fun and we got a great guest today and I got I'm very excited. I'm very excited about his book and I can't wait to just talk about how wonderful, how exciting his life. I'm not going to say his life has been, but I'm going to say it really like segments of his life have been. So that we'll just, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it later. Anyway, I gotta, I gotta go and I gotta share something with you guys. Last night, my buddy, Tony Hernandez, who is now a master barber went and well, made me beautiful. I know a lot of you people are still trying to figure out how the hell he made me beautiful, but here he is <laughs> making me beautiful. Uh, it kind of looks like a uh, mafia hit, doesn't it? Something out of New York City, just waiting for my throat to get cut, but he did a great job. So, you know, if you guys are interested in the Western New York area, just let me know. I, I, I mean, really unreal what he did to me. And of course I walked in there with, I was pretty shaggy with whatever little hair I do have. So uh, another thing I want to go and tell everybody, uh, today I got uh, my buddy Dan Kless from the Hinsdale House uh, received a haunted object that I went and I, I picked up, and we'll be talking about it because uh, we didn't open it right away, and I felt like it, it had a weird vibe to it. It really did. It really did, but it's very innocuous, so we're going to talk about that maybe next week. Uh, the other thing I want to tell everybody about, this just came in. This just came in. Uh, this Saturday... The Hull House in Lancaster, New York, is going to have a paranormal investigation, a very limited number. We're talking maybe two groups of five to seven people. That's it. That's it. And the place has got, of course, it's got the 1810 house. It's got a Victorian house, which is like hyperactive. The current, the place, the stuff that we've gotten out of there is crazy. A lot of, a lot of FUs and good stuff like that. But I mean, it's really neat. But they also had, they got a Civil War era barn on the property, but also the family cemetery has been very active. Uh, a bunch of us have actually seen uh, something in the, you know, in the, right by the fences. Uh, we've had, uh, you know, these, you know, you guys know I'm not a big flashlight guy, but I got to tell you, when somebody put two flashlights or put a bunch of flashlights out and said, only the Wheelock family turn on and the two graves are the father and son wheelock those damn flashlights turned on so it's really neat uh it's going to be 40 dollars, and again it's very very limited and the time is from eight till midnight uh it's going to a great cause nobody gets any money the uh it's a historic location here in western new york it's a hidden gem it's a jewel that people don't realize and i want people to support it if they can now uh i'm gonna go and i'm gonna Put this out on my on my Facebook page so people will be able to go and, and write it down. But I'll just give you the contact information, and it's I'm going to spell it out for everybody. A H E J M A N O W S K I at HullFamilyHome.com. If I had had the time, I would have made a banner up for it, but. Uh, unfortunately, I just didn't. I didn't have that time to do it. So anyway, please support it. It's a great thing. You guys were fantastic last year. We raised eleven thousand dollars for the house uh, during the the whole COVID thing going on, and it and be prepared also to be uh, uh, go under COVID rules and regulations, masks. Try to you know we're going to go and everybody keeps a, a safe distance. So it's it's just a wonderful thing. Please support it. Please support, it. especially everybody here in Western New York. Uh, it, you, you know, I don't have to preach to you guys about what preservation is and how much is, is gone out there. But anyway, now let me get to our guest because I got so much to talk to him about and I've known him for a while. And, uh, we first met down in, uh, phenomenology in Gettysburg uh, quite a few years ago. And, uh, to get the guy is hysterical. I'm going to tell you right now, he's hysterical. He's a great person, but he is an amazing person an amazing person. He is an author. He's a folklorist. He's a paranormal researcher. He's a sought after speaker, man. Everybody loves him. He's a media personality, storyteller. And now he's really, he's an adventurer. 
Uh, he's an amazing, he has, he's, he's, his, his bio is like, his resume is like crazy. It's crazy. Uh, on the internet, he's got, currently he's got the speakeasy, which is, he does interviews. It's a great, great, great show. Uh, New England, uh, legends podcast, which is a great show. Uh, he has been, uh, Oh my God! I don't even know all the TV shows that he's been featured on. Or he's worked on New England Legends, uh, Ghost Adventures. He's done on-camera stuff, but also a, he's really a highly sought-after researcher. The Devil's Road. It's a true story of uh, Ed and Lorraine Warren. I want to talk about that just a little bit uh, because he knew them. He talked to them, and we'll we'll get into it. It's a fantastic. I love the stories he tells me. He really is. He's a true storyteller. Met one of uh, a few of his many books. I don't have all his books. He's got like, you know what? He's probably got a thousand of them. And he's probably got like one of these days. Uh, he's going to be like Stephen King, like the Bachman books all of a sudden come out of nowhere. He's probably got, he's probably writes under a pseudonym like Tim Shaw or something. So uh, he, some of his books, who's haunting the white house. Picture yourself legend tripping, which I like uh, the world's most haunted places, which I have ghosts of war, which I have. Weird Massachusetts. I don't have that one. Of course, I have relatives in Massachusetts, so that's pretty weird enough. Uh, the Ghost Files Encyclopedia of Haunted Places. That was probably one of the first books in the library that I actually bought. Our Haunted Lives, Communicating with the Dead, uh, the Nightmare Encyclopedia, and his current book is going to be something that's amazing. We're going to talk about today is The Call of Kilimanjaro. So everybody, please welcome to the Black Cat Lounge a dear friend. I really consider him a friend. Uh, he's a He's taught me a lot about what I know about media and and you know if if I have a question about something he oh he's he's not one of the he's not one of these stars that like who is this little guy and he always writes me back especially he always gives me great advice so please welcome Jeff Belanger my friend hey Jeff how are you thank you for being on the lounge and you know what the check is in the mail buddy so oh, oh I never said that sorry sorry oh that that's it. <laughs> Tim, after that intro, maybe, uh, I don't know, maybe I could do better. That's what I'm thinking. <laughs> like, you think so? I'm you, like, think you know, I should reach out to Oprah. I should. I should. Like, that's the next logical step. Tim, it's good to see you, as always, uh, after all these years. We got to look out for each other, of course. We, we all do. That's how it is. I mean, it's a small. The funny thing is, as you know, if you've been in this community more than, say, 15, 20 minutes, uh, <laughs> it's small. <laughs> Right, it is. It is. It's so small, small, and and stuff gets around, and uh, and and we've all been burned somewhere along the way. We've all had successes somewhere along the way. We won't. We won't talk about the burns. No, we but we've all got them. <laughs> yeah, but so, so you know, you 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 try to help someone else avoid your pain along the way. But anyway, I appreciate it. It's good to be with you. Good to be here in your basement. Uh, hey, you know what? It's the it's the place to be. Yeah, you know this. Your speakeasy is like. You know, it was, yeah, I'll be honest with you. It was, ex and it, it was an excuse to sit down and, and have a couple shots. And as a matter of fact, I got onto your show late. Uh, you just put a little thing out I, this week or was it last week where you're drinking a beer? Yeah. It was just and I didn't have any beer. I didn't have any beer in the house. Yeah. So I, I had to have like three or four like Jameson's just because, you know, I didn't have anything. So, but you, you know, you bring to so do. Yeah, you bring a lot of joy to everybody. Now, you know what? I want to go, and there's a lot of people that watch the show now that are they're actually pretty new to the uh, paranormal world. And uh, I want to go, and we're just going to touch a little bit about, you know, some sure. of the projects that you've worked on. And right now, first of all, I know it's not the season for it, but let me find, let me find the proper photograph of you uh, with your clothes on uh, mm -hmm. right here. Oh yeah, that sweater. What? More he, mileage out of that. He, this guy has the greatest Christmas series to talk about that I have ever met, and he is a specialist. I won't say specialist; he's a folklorist, and he really does a great job when he describes Krampus. Now, what is it about? Before we go on, what the hell is it about Krampus, and why are you so? And, and I've heard you speak. I've seen your stuff on TV. But there, it's like you almost have like a passion to Krampus. I don't know what it is. What is it that that brings it out? You know, and I for do know. You, and for you, it's like Christmas all year round. Every time I'm with you, it's like Christmas. So, well, so I, I love all the holidays. I so one of the things, and I think living here in the Northeast, like you, like you, you know, we live in a, a climate where you know we have four seasons, and there's there's seasonality. There's things I look forward to in the summer. There's things I look forward to in the fall, and in the winter, and in the spring, and so on. And there's holidays that fall in there. 
what I love about Christmas mm -hmm. is when we can take this sacred holiday that's so special to everyone and get just a little bit irreverent with it. And there's nothing more irreverent than Krampus. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> and, and you learn. And and the, and so I always, I'm always intrigued like with the backstory, you know, how did we get to right now? How come we talk about that building being haunted? How come we talk about uh, Christmas and Santa Claus and all this other stuff? How did that happen? And when you go back far enough and you sort of unpack it, you realize like, well, wait a minute, this has got a dark, scary story to it. Something that people ought to know. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and then, and then I find personally that when you know all that history and backstory, it means even more. Um, you know, it's one thing if, if, if uh, a TV show or something says that building's haunted, there's a ghost of a little girl inside. Eh, so what? Right. But if we get through it, if we go through and unpack all the history and the tragedies and the things that left a mark, then that building, we connect to the, the people that were inside and, and, and then it starts to mean something and it's important. I think so too. And a lot of times people don't realize that so much of the of of the urban legends are so rooted in something, some kind of historical fact. And oh god, I can't remember the one you were talking about. Uh uh of course I'm old now, so my my brain my brain doesn't work as well as it used to, but you have such a fascination for it. But I think your style, the way you present as a storyteller is so polished and it's so it's so enjoyable did you have to go and did you have you like always been able to be a storyteller since because some people are natural storytellers right from kids but other like myself who is like as uh has the finesse of a rock <laughs> did you, have you, you know, I had I had to go and read books on how to and how to public speak and that sort of thing. So, what what is it with you? Were you one of those kids that were just, you know, that you were able to go and like tell these crazy stories and everybody loved it? No, um, I really was, I told jokes as a kid. I was a good joke teller. I could make people laugh. That that I was always good at, even from a young age, and I liked it. I liked making people laugh. Uh, as I got older, and once I started writing, um, when you're when you write something, uh, you know, I started writing for newspapers and magazines, you agonize over where you put every word, you know, and you, you think about like, well, where do I want to start? Where do I want to go? Where do I want to finish? And that uh, that's so important as a writer. When I started to transition from not just a writer to also a public speaker, it was a clunky, hard transition because I got so hung up on wordsmithing, on how I want to turn a phrase and everything else. I'd get in front of an audience and I would try to memorize this stuff that I had written or these bullet points that I had. And then realizing that I'm, I'm not good at memorization, never was. It's why I was not a straight A student, not even a straight B student, to be honest. Um, you know, I got by, uh, I just couldn't memorize. I still can't memorize. But once I started to let go and just sort of like, uh, like let the story kind of seep in and not get so hung up on every single word, then I, I realized that along the way, I, I've always sort of felt that I'm like, I'm a vessel for these legends, right? Like I'm, I'm the conduit to get them from some obscure place to a place with a little more light, a place where, where people can see them and experience them, learn from them. I feel like these legends and stories are like a sermon from the past and I'm their minister, but I just, it just moves through me, right? I, I'm not crafting anything. I'm just trying to pass it along. But I will say this, along the way, I have taken acting classes and I've taken improv classes. And that helped me a lot as far as like, not just having some sort of stage presence, but also engaging with the, the words that I'm using, words that are coming from me. And that helped a lot just to, to realize like, wait a minute, a story has emotion to it. Like that's what's important is to connect with it. But then also to connect with the audience. That's yes. so important, right? You've got to yes. not just connect with what you're talking about and care about it, but you have to connect with the people out there. And I miss live audiences so much. Oh, dear Lord. You know, I mean, it's this mm -hmm. is a substitute. It's the next best thing. I get it. If we didn't, if I didn't have this, I'd be dead. Forget it. But, I agree with you. I agree with you because. But the people. Oh, there's nothing better. Then, you know what? I'll speak for a quarter in front of like three people. It doesn't bother me. But on the other hand, there's nothing more satisfying than getting out in front of a group of people and just being able to speak. And 
understanding it's a vibe that you get back at you yeah and i think the whole secret like i think i got hooked on it when i started doing uh church services mm -hmm. and all of a sudden so i used to get in trouble because i could never follow because i'm dyslexic i could never follow the the sequence of the service uh i would forget where i would be and all that but when it came to telling something or just speaking or you know being able to go and trying to convey that idea it was so easy for me to do so yeah i it, and i miss i really do i don't miss the travel you know me i mean i i don't i don't like to travel as much as like I'll, ever a lot of other people do but on the other hand i i miss actually being with all the other people out there and i got a crazy photo that we took at old mill and this is this is this will go i'm nervous we all have our pants on, so we're lucky. Okay. We're all good. We're all, that's not the photo. I, I didn't put that photo in, in the group. Uh, right. But this will tell everybody the true essence of Jeff Belanger when he is on the road and he is like on, when we are all on, when we're all happy and we're all speaking to people. And here it is. Oh, that's it. That, that's it. that is that is the that is the typical Jeff Belanger photograph that you will get with him. Yeah, I, I love that. I cherish that one. I really what do because it? that was just so a selfie, right? That, that, yeah, and I'm like, well, let's be interesting. Let's not just like, right? It's true, and yeah. I will tell you that Jeff, that I have stolen that one many times. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> I'm gonna take a selfie with you right now. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. How's my hair? Oh, that's a good one. There we are. There we are. That's a that's a picture within a picture within a picture. I, uh, I love an inception that. selfie. <laughs> yeah. Okay. We're not going to go any further on that one. Now, I want to go and I want to tell some people about. Um, I we found were, the fa I, I found this fascinating. Are we talking about shock docs? Shock docs. Yes, we're going to talk yes. about shock okay. docs. I'm ready. Uh, I didn't know this. I, one day I'm sitting there and, and shock docs is going to be on. And I said, Oh, that's cool. And it's going to, I'll be about Ed and Lorraine Warren. And I have, I met Lorraine and I know Tony Sparrow, the, you know, the son-in-law and, and, you know, of course we, everybody knows the Godfather, you know, Johnny Zaffis, the nephew, you know, so it's sort of like a family. And all of a sudden I'm watching it. It's pretty cool. And then all of a sudden I look, I go, I know that guy. And Jeff's on the Jeff's on 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 the screen. First of all, it's kind of a shock. I had to put down my my greasy pizza and my beer because you know I didn't want to spill it. But also, it was it was really great. And then they had like all these you know uh, you know recordings that were done and they were being played. So yeah. I texted Jeff. I said, "Really great job, really dude, really." It, and it was. It, you guys, if you guys want to see it, it's called uh, the Devil's Road. Uh, you know, so I mean, it, it's really, it's really good. So I'm going. I was amazed at those, at the interviews. I had never heard of them. I, you know, and I, you know, of course. I mean, you know, everybody doesn't know everything. And tell everybody about, about those cassettes and the interviews. <laughs> so a lot of the audio you heard in that of Ed Warren speaking, not all of it, but a lot of it was mine. Like I, I, I interviewed Ed all those years ago um, for a newspaper. That was one of my. That was the first published paranormal article I ever did was an interview with Ed and Lorraine Warren. It was in October of 1997. If you'd like to do the math. Uh, I was married in 85. So you know what? It's not that old. <laughs> so, yeah, but that's, I mean, so, you know, I, I mean, I knew, I grew up in the town next to them. I knew them since I was about 12. Wow. I've been to their programs, been to their house, been to their museum, um, you know, interviewed them for, for various projects, not just that one. And so I had all this audio tape. And so the, yeah, the production company's like, oh, we're, we're dying looking for like Ed Warren stuff. And I said, oh, I got this like 45 minutes of interview that I did with him about basically this is your life. And, um, and so, yeah, they, the, a lot of that stuff was, was actually my, my audio. That was amazing. Yeah. And, and again, you never know. That's one thing I love about the networking and, and the friendships that we developed on the road. Uh, you never know what somebody may have tucked away someplace and, you know, we'll be talking about something. And Zaphis is the, is the biggest culprit because I'll say to him, listen, the X, Y, and Z. Uh, and he'll go, oh, yeah, I got like three of those. And this is what I did to go and calm him down. And it's like you sit there and go, 
Jesus, this this is wonderful. This is this is great. This is fantastic. You know what? I'm going to take an early break, really quick. All right. Uh, and uh, the reason why I'm going to do that is because I really want to spend the time talking about your new book, Call of Kilimanjaro, because this there there's just it's such a personal book. Uh, there's a reason for it, the goal, why. Uh, I what you and I'm going to tell you what before I even break off, I'm going to come and tell you that a lesser man couldn't have done that. What what you did, I don't care what anybody says, and I and you're a pretty and no matter what anybody thinks of you, you're a humble guy. And I know for a fact that I would have probably got like 30 feet out of the first base camp, grabbed my chest and fell over. So <laughs> everybody <laughs> kick back and uh, please, this is the Black Cat Lounge. I am Tim Shaw. Our guest tonight is the awesome Jeff Belanger. Pay some bills, baby. The Black Cat Lounge is brought to you by Paranormal Oddities, the little store with the big heart. Patronus Photographic, fine art, photography, and design. Nancy's Sewing Room, aprons, masks, and handmade purses. And Wild Raven, hand-poured candles for those magical times. And we are back. This is the Black Hat Lounge, Tim Shaw. And our guest tonight is... He's a renaissance man. I'm just going to run. I'll just throw that out there. Uh, I don't like throwing like a lot of different like adjectives describe people, but you are. You're you're an amazing person. So our guest is the handsome devil may care New Englander, Jeff Belanger. Hey, Jeff, I got to tell everybody. I've been dying to talk to you about your book. And the reason being is we were uh we were in Chicago, which was like an interesting trip. And uh, outside, <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll, leave yeah, we'll leave it at that. And let them wonder. <laughs> let them wonder. They're like, oh my God, they got arrested. Like their minds are going to all kinds of places that are just so far from the truth, but it's fine. We did, we did find good food. I, I will say we that did. we did find, we did find good food, but we got sausages in Chicago. We were fine. We ate fine. We didn't start. That, that was it. The, the, yeah. yeah that's, anyway, it was interesting, but. You show you gave me a postcard, which I still have in my collection, of course, because I don't throw nothing out. I am I am I'm walking in the foots of John Zappas, the haunted hoarder. <clears throat> and um we talked about your experiences on Kilimanjaro. And I mean I sat there and I thought to myself, the rest of the event I don't really care about. Because this is what really true meaning is, what what spirituality is, what what you know, pushing yourself for a reason for a cause is, and I'm going to put the book up here real quick. Here's the book uh, called Kilimanjaro, uh, finding hope above the clouds. And I urge everybody to buy this book. Uh, he, Jeff was kind enough to get me a PDF file uh, to read it for the interview today. And I'm going to tell, and I told Jeff off air that I will be buying the book so that I can add it into my collection. And then I can actually, I, I might buy, and to be tr truthful, I might buy two and give one to a, a local little library that people, uh, so people can see this and people really can read it. Now, Jeff, I got to ask you, man, what, what possessed you to go and, and really, and, and climb a mountain? Basically, this is not something that I would even think about. I, you know, for me to climb out of this basement up the stairs, <laughs> You know, sometimes it's like, man, yeah, maybe I'll just sleep in the, the lazy boy down here or something, you know? Uh, but I mean, what, why did you do it? I mean, this is, it, this was something that was, is awe inspiring to me. Yeah. Thank you. No, it's, um, well, there's a lot of reasons, you know, and Kilimanjaro is uh, a place I've thought about since childhood. It's a place that I remember I first heard about it in Toto Song Africa uh, as a kid in the 80s that loved it. And then I became a hiker in college and after college and, and started hiking mountains. And I loved getting outside and, and New England mountains, you know, they're, they're nothing compared to Kilimanjaro. It's right. 19,341 feet. It's the tallest mountain in Africa. It, it straddles the border between ta uh, Tanzania and Kenya and Eastern Africa, just below the equator. Um, I took Swahili in college, two semesters, not just one, two, because um, I needed a language requirement with, I had an amazing professor. So I took it because I failed French one and my last name, Belanger, which by the way, if we headed north to Canada would become Belanger. 
same as in France. And um, <laughs> the, the French teacher just looked at me and said, your name, should, you should be fluent. And I'm like, I've been here so long. My name is Belanger, you know, like, <laughs> sorry. Um, so, so I took Swahili. There was like all these little things coming together. Um, but the real, like, like the, the real moment started back in 2013 when my brother-in-law, Chris was diagnosed with cancer. And, uh, and, and I have a picture of the two of you. Yeah. Right that's here. The, yeah. That, that's a great photo of the two of you. Yeah. We were at, we were at a Patriots game. He's a Giants fan. It was the Patriots versus the Giants. And, um, that was, that was sort of near the end of his journey with cancer. But, um, funny thing about a death sentence like cancer is that, you know, with my brother, I never had a brother. I just had one sister growing up and, um, he was the first guy that I was like, wow, he's not a jerk, you know, <laughs> which is, <laughs> I can't tell you how much I'm, that's the highest compliment, right? Like, um, cause my sister dated some, some winners along the way. And, uh, <laughs> does she does she know that does yeah she... <laughs> yeah yeah it should be the first to tell you uh i love it <laughs> so um anyway so i was like oh funny guy smart guy fun to have around at holidays and things like that but once he he gets this this horrible um you know meeting with a doctor that he tell he's told you've got tumors everywhere fully metastasized it's stage four you've got 18 to 24 months to live and suddenly you're like oh that whole like, yeah, we'll get to know each other better along the way. Um, you're, you're suddenly faced with a timeline. And the first year was was a wash because he was just in such a depression. Yeah. That yeah. Uh, And I don't know how I would feel. I don't know how I would what I would do if faced the same thing. But he spent that first year just, you know, in a dark, dark place. But then started to kind of come out of it as ironically as he's getting worse, as his body's deteriorating. And, and we got closer and he, and he knows my paranormal background. And so... We talked, uh, we talked for a while about this process he was going through. And by the time it got to be uh, the late fall of 2015, and he's really, you know, taking turns for the worst, and now he's in the hospital, and, um, and he's having these out-of-body experiences. He's, he's, he, he called me from the hospital and said, I, I was out of my body, 20 feet out of my body, looking down at myself and petrified because I'm afraid of heights. And then it would happen again. It would happen again. And... Uh, I, you know, clearly this guy's going through something. And I've talked to other people who are near the end of their journeys and heard about out-of-body experiences before. So when he right. told me that, you know, you're like, yeah, I sort of think I know what that means. And then, um, and then eventually the doctors tell him it's, it's time to go home to hospice care and there's nothing more we can do. And when I went down to Connecticut to see him, uh, it was about December 14th or 15th of 2015, um, that's a tough trip when you know why you're going, you know what this visit yeah. is. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. It is. This, this is, it's crystal clear. I mean, he's really, he's on oxygen. He's in a hospital bed. He's pretty much bed bound now. And when I walked into the room, uh, his skin was absolutely yellow from jaundice from his kids. His organs are failing. They're not removing toxins from his blood and his skin is completely yellow. But the way the sunlight was hitting him, he was just glowing like this golden man. And we spoke for hours about death, about this thing he was going through, but not in some foreboding or sad way, just this sort of like philosophical way and this enlightened way. And it was the most profound conversation I've had maybe in my life. And he told me he was having multiple out-of-body experiences now, like multiple times a day. And that he, I said, what do you think it means? And he said, I feel like something is, is, is trying to get out of this broken, busted up machine. And it's going to pretty soon just stay out. And a week later, uh, I believe he was right because he passed away. And, um, and that was hard. My nephew was just five years old at the time when he died. And it was, um, it was just devastating for all of us. Like, what does this mean? My sister, like, what, you know, what are we going to do? And then eight months later, I was doing a paranormal event where we're raising money for, you know, preserve a, a location that, as you know, you do them too. And uh, my friend Amy from the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society said, hey, Jeff, we got a new fundraiser coming up. And I said, oh, Amy, you know, I'm so busy. I got so much going on. She said, we're going to climb Mount Kilimanjaro. And uh, I, I just, I mean, it's like the needle on the record, you know, you know, like <laughs> Kilimanjaro. She didn't know I took Swahili in college. She didn't know about like my hiking background. She didn't know, you know, all that stuff. And I was just like, 
cross this big item off my bucket list, do it raising money to fight cancer. I just lost my brother-in-law to cancer months ago. Um, it, it was going to be in March, which is a good time of the year for me. As you know, we get busy in, in the fall. Right, in October. right. I'm like, March, that's a good time of year. I'd be gone how long? Two weeks? <clears throat> I think I could pull that off. How much? That's a lot of money, but I, I think I could save that up. I think I could swing it. And I just looked at her and I just said, Amy, I'm in. Um, I'm just a few years younger than Chris and I just kind of committed to it. And from there I started telling everyone what I was going to do because I, I didn't want to have to come back and tell everyone I didn't make it. And so that was part of my motivation was to like start training a lot of cardio and just get so singularly focused on this big fitness goal, this big life goal to go to Africa and, and have this experience and get to the top mm -hmm. of the largest mountain on the continent. And, uh, I, I had focus that year like I've never had or, or you know, that I can't recall anyway in, in many, many years. And part of it, too, is, you know, when you're when you get to be in your 40s, your life is is sort of comfortable, hopefully. Right. I mean, like, you know, you, you, you the, the people that annoy you, you tend to keep them away. You got the friends that you like, the house, the job that you're good at it. And, and you're you're sort of in this rut, even if it's a rut of your own design, you're still kind of in this like treadmill of take care of my daughter and take care of the, you know, I got to cut the line, right. got to pay the bills, got to get right. the oil changed on the car, got to do my job, got to do, you know, got to try to sleep tonight, you know, all that stuff. And so um, this was something that was unique and for me and to try to prove something uh, clearly to others, not going to lie, right? I was trying to prove something to others, but also very much trying to prove something to myself. Now I got to, I got to go and I got to, I got to ask you this. Or first, I want to I want to go and I uh, first I want to share this with everybody. I went and I'm reading it and I'm looking. I'm reading your book and you get to this point where you do a quote. And I look at this quote and I said, "You got to be kidding me! You are you kidding me?" And here's the quote. It's by Jack Kerouac from the Dharma Bums. I, I Jack Kerouac. I read in college. It's one of those. He's one of he's one of those authors, those road authors that I absolutely loved. And uh, basically, here here's the quote. I I just it, I, I'm sure I'm getting choked up right now just even thinking about it. In the end, you won't remember the time spent working in an office or mowing your lawn. Climb that goddamn mountain. And a lot of you people, a lot of everybody knows out there that. I mean, I had problems, uh, you know, I had some pretty severe problems and surgeries and all sorts of nonsense like that. And I always remember that I thought to myself, well, I'm not going to stop this. I am not going to stop being who I am. Uh, you know, I gave myself only a certain amount of time to really be depressed or mourn what's going on. And I was going to go and I was going to push forward. And I read that, and I'm just like, son of a bitch. I, I hate – I didn't want to admit that you and I had more in common than, than just being the paranormal geeks out there. Uh, I, I was just I was just blown away. And when I read that, that made me sit down and read the uh, – read your book from, from cover to cover. I didn't put it down. That's how great it is. And it's just – Thank you. And it's fun. I mean, you know, I'm an adventure guy. I love, you know, all that stuff. But I think I think it, it's really I think the whole thing the reason everything struck home with me anyway. So anyway, let's talk about your experiences, dude. Right up front, I'm gonna come up and tell you. I used to I used to be a backwoods guy, go out there and sleep on the ground and all that, sleep in tents and all that. What was it like? Because what I love the way you, you wrote the book was it got progressively harder and harder and harder and harder. What were your thoughts as like you start off and it's like, okay, this is cool. We got porters. We got to do this, do that. What was the, you're about halfway up. What was, what were your thoughts at that point when it really started to hit home that, Hey, this is the real deal. You know, now we're starting to gain some altitude. Uh, the pressure's on. Yeah. So th the first day, I mean, if you saw this trail, it was just this neatly groomed with like wooden borders and stuff. I'm like, 
people back home in New England would be embarrassed for me right now, right? I mean, this is there. We've got much harder mountains around here that, than than what we were walking on that first day, and we're in the rainforest. Mm -hmm. And my my mind is so scattered. I'm thinking about like, oh come on, I, I um, you know, I'm thinking about the emails I'm missing and all that other stuff. And then we're walking along at this very slow pace, and one of our guides looks up in the trees and says, "Oh look!" And then we see monkeys. And I'm like, wow, monkeys, wow. this is so cool, right? Like uh, we're in the wild, right? This is this is their turf. And so that's kind of neat. When we got to the first camp though, I, uh, we're at about 8,500 feet, which is really not that bad. I've been higher in Colorado, you know? Um, uh, we were at Cripple Creek, that was like 9,500 feet. Like it's it's not that bad. Um, so I, I'm, I don't like camping, I'm not a fan. Um, I like hiking and getting dirty, but I want like a shower at the end of the day and a really nice big feather bed. And so <laughs> lest you think I'm like some rugged outdoorsman, like I, I, I can be in doses, but the idea of like, you know, so I unroll this, this self-inflating mattress pad that, that was, I borrowed for the trip and I'm watching it just slowly go from like this to this. <laughs> <laughs> yep. yep. I have one of those. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, you poke it, you're like, what is is that going to be enough to keep 195 pounds of me off the dirt ground? And so uh, then I get in my sleeping bag on top of that that night and I lay down and I'm like, nope, I don't think it's doing a damn thing. In fact, I'm not sure there's a difference between it being there and not being there. <laughs> <Yeah>. Right? Like, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm not going to remove it because it's got to have something. But uh, anyway, that whole night I hardly slept. I'm like, I don't think I'm cut out for this, man. I'm, I'm too soft. I should have done this 10 years ago. I should have done this 50, in my 30s, in my 20s. But nope, here I am in my 40s. No turning back now. And I hardly slept. And I got up the next day, you know, every, you know, I, I, when I, when I stood up straight after getting out of the tent, it sounded like when you, you take bubble wrap and you twist it. So, so it goes pop, 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 pop. But that was my back, like, right. And, uh, I'm just like, yep. oh man, it's going to be yep. six days to the top and two days to get back down. Can I do this? And, uh, shoot, man, you know, you, you start to wonder, but something sort of miraculous happened around the third day, we get higher and higher. And once you get above 10,000 feet, 11,000 feet, 12,000 feet, I mean, nothing grows up there. There's no trees. There's no monkeys. There's no bugs. There's nothing. There's just very little vegetation. You just get higher and higher. And something happened around the third day where I realized that, uh, I, it was getting quiet inside. You know, uh, there, you, there's no sounds either. Just the wind, whatever sound the wind makes as it hits you, blows by your ear or whatever. There's no planes flying overhead. There's no cars or highways or trains nearby. You don't hear anything. It's just total silence. And I realize I'm getting unplugged. I'm not thinking about my email and my work voicemail and all that other stuff. I'm just getting unplugged and finding some some inner quiet and 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 finding that this like inner child is still in there. And, and you look around this environment where, I mean, there's stuff growing. There's beautiful flowers, by the way, that, that are growing in this incredibly hostile environment. And you look around and you realize, wait a minute, if you're going to survive here, it takes grit. And grit is something that I think a lot of us know we have when we're younger, when we're, when we're trying to make our next rent check and when we're trying to get our car fixed and when we're sleeping on friends' couches, we know we got grit. Like, I'm going to do something with this. I'm going to make it. But then as you get comfortable, when you get older, like you, you don't really need it that much. But all of a sudden I realize I'm like, hey, man, I still got it. That grit's still in there. I can sleep on in a tent uh, with the help of sleeping pills, I might add. <laughs> I did. I had the force. I, thank God I brought them. Ooh, <laughs> made all the difference. <laughs> listen, uh, listen, I, I'm, I, I agree with you. A little ambient. Yeah. Uh, you know, especially when you have to go and do like the real heavy, you know, you're going to walk. I mean, I did, I did a two day, 20, I think it's 25 mile March from Frederick, Maryland to Gettysburg, Pennsylvania for the 130th anniversary. Let me tell you what that ambient to be able to sleep that night, yeah. you know, in the rain and get up there and go, you have that, you got that oomph to get moving at least you got some sleep. Otherwise, I would have been a casualty. You need it. You need it. You need it for sure. So I don't regret the sleeping pills, not at all. But um, but yeah. So as we get higher and higher, um, but uh, but but it was it was just you know um, you you realize that that grit is still there. And I'm, I'm and then as we get really high up, once we get up to like the Barafu base camp, fifteen thousand feet, 
um, at this point, like the, the journey is very much inward. There's, there's not a lot of joking around anymore. It's it, quite frankly, earlier, like 13,000 feet, myself and one of the other members of our group was about 12. There was 12 of us coming up from the uh, Leukemia Lymphoma Society. And this girl and I started singing uh, Spice Girls. And we were just goofing around. And, you know, we're like, if you want to be my lover, you got to get. And then we were like, oh. <laughs> like, just that. That's it. Just like 10 seconds of the song. And you're like, oh, I'll catch up. And it's no joke. It takes that much out of you. Like there's not enough air up there. Right. Uh, and it gets exponentially worse the higher you get. Yep. And you just don't know how you're going to deal with it until you get to that altitude. So you calm down, you walk really slow, and you just get to the next camp. The whole trip is 42 miles, 42 miles to get up to the top and back down, uh, six days up, two days down, as I said before. But once we're at that the, the Barafu base camp, um, the plan is to uh, have a little bit of food at like four in the afternoon mm -hmm. then get in the tents. Cause we got to get up at 11 at night to start for the summit at midnight. We're going to start going up. It's, it's a uh, 3.1 wow. miles. It's going to take eight hours. So we have to get up there about sunrise, right. get back down to Barafu camp, eat something and then get down to the next camp. It's going to be a long, long, like, you know, brutal wow. slog at this point. And this is where you really need, you know, the metal. And uh, when I got up that night at like 11 and got out of the tent and I'm a New England guy, I've been out in the mountains in January, in February, I've been in sub-zero. I, I mm -hmm. know, I know what to do. I stepped out and that was the coldest I've ever been. And uh, it is. You talk, you, you talk about trying to sleep in the cold. Yeah. And it's like, and I, and one of the photos I saw, you have a mummy bag. Yeah. And that's the only way that you can stay warm yeah. in, in that altitude. Because I just thought to my, I, I just thought to myself, how could you even have your face exposed? It had to be that cold. That, that mummy bag, my sister gave me that for Christmas. I mean, ahead of time, I knew, I said, Hey, I got this big trip coming. If anyone's looking for Christmas gift ideas for me, like, here's the list, here's the things I need. And my sister got me the, um, uh, the, the mummy bag. It's a zero degree rated it. For those who don't know, it's like a ski parka. And the only thing that shows is like, the circle around your face and that thing was so warm it was just heavenly it was um that was just a that was a luxury in a in a harsh environment was to get into that thing and once you zip it up it's like an oven in there and and it was actually really comfortable but um but that night once we start for the summit uh every step is just higher than you've ever been before and the difference between 15,000 feet and 16,000 feet is just exponential like when you go from 8,000 feet to 9,000 feet you don't really feel it all that much as far as the oxygen goes. Right. But you, you can tell 15 to 16 and 16 to 17 is even worse. And 17 to 18 is even worse than that. Uh, the, you just know the oxygen is below you. To give you an idea, when an air, when you're in an airplane that flies above 10,000 feet, they're required to carry supplemental oxygen. We're, <laughs> we're at 15,000 feet when we're getting started, you know, for the summit. So we're already like way up there. And, uh, and, and as, you know, as the night's wearing on and we're just going so slow and it is so hard to breathe and it's so cold and I've got this balaclava on, which covers everything, but like, you know, your eyes, but I can't get enough air through that fabric. And so like, I'm pulling it down to, to breathe, but then my face is too cold. So I put it up to get warm and I'm just alternating between breathing and being warm. And it's just so, uh, so, so difficult, uh, you know, as I get higher and higher, you know, just trying to catch my breath. And then finally, uh, it's like three 30 in the morning and I don't know how much higher I can go. You know, we are just huffing and puffing and we're, we're literally passing plaques where people have died from the altitude. And then around four 30 in the morning, I turn around and I look and I see just this little bit of light on the horizon. And I think, okay, if I can just, let me just see the sunrise. Let me just keep going until that happens. And, you know, once the sun starts coming, man, every, every 10 minutes you turn around, it's a little bit brighter, a little bit brighter. And then finally we get to the Stella point, 18,800 feet and the very rim of the volcano. There's still a long way to go to get to the actual highest point. But right there, I turn around and I see that. I see that view right there. That is the sunrise from Stella point. And at that moment, everything just sort of changed. Uh, it was just one of these things that I was like, oh my God, you know, the, the, the whole world is warmed up maybe 15 degrees. Now that there's sun, you can see, you don't need your headlamp anymore. And in this moment, I felt, I truly felt the presence of, of God, spirit, 
spirit of the mountain, whatever term you want to use. And I felt the presence of my brother-in-law with me, like right there, right at that moment. And I just felt judged and deemed worthy to be there. That's amazing. And That's amazing. I knew, and I knew right there, right there at that sunrise, I'm like, I'm going to make it. Like, this is a done deal. This is yeah. finished. Uh, there's another 500 vertical feet, but like, this is happening. This is, it's just a matter of just finishing it now. And, uh, and we did, we did. What about brain fog? Because I know for a fact when I've, when I've gone up some higher altitudes, when, when I was younger, much younger, maybe you're, maybe your age, young man, uh, brain fog was a huge thing that, uh, you really had to watch because I remember becoming so disorientated, not sick or anything but disorientated that i mean i think i went to try to zip my jacket or something and i couldn't figure out how the zipper worked so yeah it, was that something that you guys that you had a yeah no that, li that literally happened to me um wow. I, at one point we we stopped to uh to pee and you know it, it, we were probably around 17 and a half thousand feet at this point or eighteen thousand feet and i had the, i had a really great winter shell jacket that had magnets in the zipper that's, that's, you know, so that you just had to get close and they would pull together and you zip them up. And so, uh, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm trying to get this thing together and I feel like I'm drunk, but not the fun drunk, just the like completely yes. not coordinated drunk. Yes. <laughs> and, and, and the, I can't seem to line up this zipper. This, this just doesn't make any sense to me. And finally, one of our guides comes over and just like a child just zips me up. And, uh, at another point I had, a, I had a big mitten glove on. And I dropped it just to my feet, you know? And so I bent over to pick it up. And when I stand back up, I'm just like, oh my God, right? Like that took so much out of me, just bending over to pick up a glove and then standing back up. And I just thought, this is no joke, right? This is not a joke at all. Like we have to be that careful. And our guides are looking into our eyes and they're checking vitals. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's dangerous. This is where, you know, some people have died. Yes. Um, but yeah, no, that fog was real. In fact, on the way back down, once we made the summit, um, I, I took that mitten off again because I had to pee again behind one of the rocks. And when I came back to where our group was, I just walked 10, 15 feet behind the rock and, and back. I said, oh, my mitten's missing. Therefore, it must be between here and 15 feet ago, right? And I go walking back saying, obviously, I dropped it between here and there. And I look and there's no mitten. Tim, It's there's no mitten. And I'm like, where else could it go? Wow. And I never got it. It's gone. I have no idea where that mitten went. I took it off 15 feet over there. And then I walked back over here and uh, impossible. It, that, wow. that's, it's probably still up there somewhere. Wow. Wow. You yeah. never told me that story. That's like, ama that's, that's like amazing that when stuff like that happens. It's Especially scary. The, but it, it is because brain fog is like the number one thing that will disorientate you. And then you're you know that that's what that's what will kill you. I mean, the, you know the, the the environment is harsh, but the effects of the environment on your on your cognitive pro, you know, processes that is scary. That is hardcore scary stuff. When that when that won't when you just can't function in that way. And one, uh, one of I the have, guys in our group, what he he was uh, when we were walking back, he started stumbling like you know like a drunken sailor, like right toward. I mean, it's just ten feet that way. And like, that's, that's into the, the, um, into the, into the volcano, right? Like, wow. I, I mean, into the crater, wow. you know? Yeah. And so he's just stumbling and I'm like, Brian, like I, I took my pole and I whacked him in the arm so I could catch up to him and grab him. Cause he was just sort of like, you know, si sidestep. And I'm like a few more feet and you go over and that's checkout time. And he's like, okay. You know, he's just, Oh my God. And so, you know, we're, we're holding him, and, and now like three of us are sold of holding each other and, and, uh, heading back down and like, you know, on the way down, it, it's, it's also exponential. You just get down 500 feet and you're like, oh, there's a lot more air down here. Yeah. There's the summit. That was the, uh, I mean, that's the trophy. That's great that you, you know, you, you want that picture, but that was not the defining moment. Right. You know, it was, but that was, that was indeed the, the, the completion. And that's also a profound moment because when you get there, you realize that this spot right here, that very spot where I'm standing is the halfway point. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, you're right. When, when you right. think about it, you're right. You are halfway there right now. 
because you got to get down. Yes. And you got to get home. And that otherwise it doesn't matter. Right. What's no. the point? What's the point of, of, of uh, you know, getting all the way to the top? If you can't get back home, it, it didn't count. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot you learn. And, and I think the mountain, I mean, I, I get it, it's not for everyone, but to me, it's like the ultimate metaphor for anything, right? Like anything can be a mountain to climb. Writing a book is a mountain to climb, Yes, you know, and writing this book, dear Lord, I've never written about my own stuff. It's hard to be you objective. Know, I was going to ask you about that because I've, I've read most of your books and I really love them. And you're very, you're very thorough about it. You're, you're, you, I, your word crafting is probably up there with some of the best writers out there. I mean, people don't realize it, you know, because they, they automatically look down at anything that's paranormal or folklore or whatever automatically, you know, you know, you know, than the ones I'm talking about, but this book, I was going to ask you how hard it, how hard is it to go and, and write about yourself? People have come up to me and asked me several times, Tim, can you write a book about like, you know, what you went through during X, Y, and Z? And I go, yeah, I can do that. And I sit down at the, at my laptop and I get two pages into it, and I'm like, "Oh no, this is I don't know if it's psychological, spiritual. I don't know what was it like for you to actually try to like pull this out of your memory, pull this out of the photographs, pull this out of your very heart, your soul, in order to go and write this." Well, that was hard, and so I I took a lot of notes and journals when I was out there. I took 1,600 photographs, um, and so when I came home, I just started. I knew I, I went through something profound, and I and I knew. I knew it. I knew it at the time. And I knew it when I was on the plane ride home and I felt like there's something big here. And so I just started writing, 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 because that also helps me process. And so that first draft, um, the, the, it was double, double what the book is right now. Like it was, it was, you know, twice the size. And I wrote everything chronologically. And I stuck to like a, an eight month period of time from the day I said, yes, I'm going to climb Kilimanjaro to the day I got home. That was going to be the, the, defining time period. And so I just, I wrote and wrote and wrote and I put in everything. And, um, it, it took me like a year and a half and nine drafts of writing this thing. To, uh, easily. Easily. I can see, I can see it. That, to, to kind of like whittle it down because what happens, you know, like I, I wrote this big long thing about how we went to REI, you know, the, the sports outfitter store. Yeah. And we had, you know, that we had a meeting with one of their guides who taught us about the different gear and he was he like didn't have much personality but it was sort of funny and 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 I, I had pages on that and then you know you read you read your drafts like a month later and you're like no one's gonna care that i went to rei <laughs> nobody and like like that's three pages right there just <sighs> delete gone you know like no one cares and then the, you know this other thing and 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 then i i got it down and i, I let someone read it and and it was like 30 percent into the book and, and then we get to africa and they're like but once you got to Africa, it got pretty interesting. And I'm like, oh, I got to kill the whole first third, right? <laughs> and, and so, uh, but they were How right. How true this is. How true it is. Yeah, yeah, they were right. And so like you you have to, and you have to be so honest, right? Like if it's going to be a memoir, that's hard. Yeah, you that's have to hard. be naked and honest and vulnerable. And and that it's it's really hard. And so what I did was um, I, I wrote this book as if I was writing it a letter to my friend, John, who's been one of my closest friends since childhood. We're the same age, you know, a lot of the same stuff in life. And I'm like, I'm going to write it solely for him because he knows me. He knows me well. And I can say things that are embarrassing or funny or weird or whatever, and, and he'll get it. And so I, I only thought about him when I was writing it and that helped. Um, and then it was just a matter of, of saying like, okay, I'm going to have to do some of this in flashback. I'll start right on the mountain. Let's just get into it. Right. And then we'll flash back when we have to. So you need, you know, a little more about my own backstory and why I'm here and what happened. And that's sort of how it, it started to come together. And then I had a great editor at the publisher. He helped a ton. Kevin was amazing. Um, and it's, it's, you know, a book's a group effort, just like, just like a hike. You know, I couldn't have yeah, done that hike is. alone. We had a whole village of people helping us get up there. Yeah, it's an, it's amazing. I have a photograph that you sent me of the guides and porters, which like to me is like amazing because it's something that you read about or you see it on TV, but you never know the importance of these people. And these are the unsung heroes. Yeah. I mean, there they, they are. are. That's, yeah. all, that's us. That's there's 12 of us in there. 12, 12 people from, uh, you know, doing the actual climb. Two of them had to turn back right after this photo. 
And, and the rest of those guys, there's 48 of them. Those are our guides, our porters, the people that, uh, you know, the cooks cook our food for everybody, like all that stuff, the, these amazing men, um, that, uh, that, that shared so much joy and, and sang, they sang these songs in Swahili, uh, at every single camp. And then eventually we knew them too. And we would sing along and man, oh man, to hear them singing songs in Swahili about Kilimanjaro right there with Kilimanjaro yeah. behind you. I mean, you know, it's not, it's, it's pretty, you know, music is great. I love music in all kinds of capacities, but man, that one just hits you right in the very deepest parts of, that, of yourself. And that, uh, had to, that had to be just amazing. Now, before we run out of time, because I could, I really, I could listen to you talk about this for hours, but I won't, I won't chain you to your basement here, but uh, <laughs> well, unless you want to be, but that's another story. Uh, I want to ask you now, I know, from a lot of the things that I've done when I, I get out there and I get this peak experience and it's like beautiful. And it's like, you're in that moment. What was it like coming home? What was, and not coming down the mountain because that's still part of the adventure because you're yeah. coming down because you come down a different path. Yep. But what was it like when all of a sudden you realize you're on the plane and you're going home. What went through your mind at that at that moment? Well, so you know, when I was on the way home, I, I wanted to be home. I wanted to get there. Um, I wanted to see my family. It had been like two weeks. My daughter's you know young at, you know at this time, and uh, I hadn't been away from her. That's the longest I'd been away from her in my in my life at, at one stretch. And so I felt like I had gone through this really transformative experience. I felt like I was I'm a better man now. I'm a better human being having done this. And I want to bring that home and show my family and my friends. And I want to be that guy at home. Um, but once I got home and, and the hugs and everything, and then, you know, trying to catch up on sleep, I, you, you realize like it is time to go back to that treadmill, back to that rut, but you're still, you're still altered now. And, and no matter how hard my days get, no matter how bad it gets, I'm a guy that climbed yeah. Mount Kilimanjaro and I get to yeah. keep that forever. Forever and exactly. ever. If someone's like chewing me exactly. out for something or, or if I'm just having a bad day, like I did that. And that helps tremendously. However, I will say this in this, I started writing and doing all that other stuff, but I had a solid three to six month hangover after this experience because it was this big bucket list. It's the thing I was so singularly focused on. I went there, I did it. I came home. Now what? <laughs> yeah. That's, yeah. Let, let, you know, look at both. Look at look at Buzz Aldrin, the depression he went he went through some really bad depression after he went to the moon on that first on the first moon landing. Sure, that hangover is the worst. It's it's a, I've had it not you know to a huge extent, but I've done some things and and it's just like you sit there for a couple of weeks and you're like, first of all you have to think about it whether or not it actually happened. That's the word. That's that was that scary. But then you just sit there and it's like every so often you catch yourself like daydreaming about it. And it's, is, was it a dream? Was it, and it affects you spiritually too. Uh, and my final question to you is spiritually, what did you bring back after this? Cause I know that, you know, cause you know, you're, you're a, you know, you're, 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 you're a character, but, and a lot of people know you as a character and you're funny and, and you're really great when you get a chance to get out there with the crowd but I know you a little bit better and spiritually, I really want to know what you brought back from this whole experience. Uh, I felt a lot closer to my spirituality than I had before. I was raised Catholic and, you know, not to, not to knock Catholicism, whatever it works for a lot of people. By the time I got to be in to college, it just didn't work for me anymore. And so i never got to the point of like atheism, but Oddly enough, through paranormal research, ghost hunting, looking for ghosts, uh, I, I kind of got on a more spiritual path, but it culminated on this mountain because it's a difference between like, you know, like seeing it in the store and trying it on and walking home with it. You know, like I felt like I, I, I literally got wrapped in it at this, in this profound experience. And, 
and it's part of me, you know, now. And that that sunrise, man, like that that stayed with me. And I've had that made into prints. It's on my wall. I I've love had, that. <clears throat> yeah, I've had postcards. I gave you one. I've given thousands of those away. And um, and I, I just kind of feel this sense of like I I touched something greater. I really, I really did in that moment. And I'm still trying to understand what it means. I'm not some evolved guru now. I just I I got a taste for something. And I definitely want more. And fortunately, that hangover does go away because there's more mountains to climb, whether metaphorically or literally, right? There's there's more How mountains true. to climb always. How true. How true that is. You know, Jeff, this has been a great hour. I, You know what? This is – I've been, I've been like salivating to, to, to be able to go and talk to you about this experience ever since Chicago. And, you know, we don't, and again, we see each other, but we don't see each other enough to be able for, for me to like nail you down because <laughs> you're, you, you know, you're one of the A-listers. I'm the CD lister. So, I mean, you're always in demand. I'm like carrying your bags. I don't so, think I'm an A-lister, but thank uh, you. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Maybe your own, be on my best day. No, 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 no. You're <laughs> an A-lister kiddo. Let me tell you. But this has been phenomenal. Tell everybody how they can get more information about you and where they can get your books. Yeah, well, you've been scrolling my website there, jeffbelanger.com. Uh, the book's available wherever you get books or eBooks, um, Kindle, whatever, Fire, um, Amazon UK, Canada. That's it, the book's all over. Um, and um, and you know, you can if you go to my website, you'll see it right there on the homepage. You can click. You can see some of the interviews I've done. You can find links to buy it. But I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate. Uh, the feedback I've gotten so far, it's only been out two weeks, two I weeks know, today. I know. Yeah, it's brand spanking new. And so some of the feedback's just been so wonderful so far because I thought of this, right? If you told me like my first book, The World's Most Haunted Places, if you're like, ah, I don't like it. I'm like, all right, well, you know, it's not your taste. You expected a different style, fine. Right, I won't lose right, right. Over. If you say you don't like this book, it's like saying you don't like me and it hurts so bad. Like it's, I feel so vulnerable on this one, man. Like, you know, but it is, but you put your heart and soul in it. Yeah. That's, it. that's your heart. And that's one of the things that I have to, I got to tell you, when I was reading the book, I'm sitting there going, this is sort of like, I, I feel like a voyeur a little bit because I've never seen, you know, I've never seen that part of you. I've seen a little bit of it when you were talking about it, when we talked about it in Chicago. And I could see in your, you know, I could hear in your voice the difference, and I could see in your face the effects of it. But this is the first time I actually got a chance to really delve into it. So, yeah, I guess I'm a pocket voyager, voyeur, I should voyeur, say. Voyeur, yeah. <laughs> yeah, voyager is like someone that like carries packs and stuff over the Great Lakes. But anyway, yeah. uh, really, thank you so much. Uh, thank for, you for sharing. You. I really, I really love it, and I know you're such, you're so busy. Uh, and you took some time out to come and, you know, just hang out with me. And, uh, and I really enjoy, I really appreciate that. No, thank you. And thank, you know, it's honestly, uh, telling this story is, it, it's tough because it's, it's one of the harder, darker points of my life. Mm -hmm. And yet one of the most joyful and amazing, right? Like, like, yes. yeah. and so, so I, I always appreciate the chance to go back there and tell it again, to, to sing the glories of this incredible place. But that also involves me going to a dark place. So it's always uh, this this yin and yang when I when I tell this story and I'm learning. Um, it it uh, it takes more out of me than just talking about legends and stuff. It's um, amazing, isn't it? Is it, yeah. isn't it amazing? At the end, after after you're done sharing, you know, yeah, and you sit there and you're like, and I know for me, I'm phys when I do my thing. I'm physically exhausted. Whereas, like, if I'm talking about ghosts or whatever or haunted yeah. objects, it's like, yeah, you know, I'm like, I'm like, well, up here, yeah, let's do it. And then, you know, if I if I share about what you know about me in some capacity, it's really I just feel so drained, and you know, so I can I can relate, but not as as quite as as uh, emotional as you. But stick wow. around for a couple seconds. I want to thank you properly while I say goodbye to everybody, and thank you guys. And again. Isn't Jeff is probably one of the most talented people that I know outside of well, everybody else I know. So anyway, <laughs> Jeff's a great guy. Thank you. Just hold on a second, there, guys. Yeah, thank you. I, I I so appreciate it. And isn't he great? Isn't that a fantastic story? It's it's just unbelievable. And that's why I wanted to share it with you. We could have talked paranormal all night, but I wanted to bring you something different because you know what? As amazing as his story is, and I just got off of a uh, uh, an interview where we talked about bringing back that childlike sense of magic 
mystery and adventure. And I think within all of us, I think it's all time for us to try to recapture that in one way, shape, or form. And uh, to, after I read Jeff's book, I mean, I was just totally enamored. And I am just like, it's just one of those books that, for me, having gone through what I have, and then having someone like Jeff do what he did, it has it affected me. It affected me, guys. So anyway, this is Tim Shaw. I want to thank everybody for tuning in tonight. and. We'll see you next week. Where else? At the Black Cat Lounge, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, where the elite meet. Where else? At the dumpster station. Take care, guys. Hello, brother. Thank you. That hey. was phenomenal. Thanks, man. I love the book. I, I really uh, we're do. We're still live, by the way. Pardon? We're still live. Oh, are we? That's all right. Everybody <laughs> loves it. <laughs>